finished on the building. Thank you so much, guys. We're here uh, most of the day. So please, could we just thank them? Uh, got a lot of work done, particularly in our kids, uh, our kids' room, getting the projector installed and all of that. And so that was just really great to get that done. Um, as I start, just before I start a fresh message, I've got to ask you, I've got to ask you about your goodness goggles. If you weren't here last week, I'm sorry, it just, this might seem really weird, but uh, who got their goodness goggles on this week? Yeah. Uh, who, who had them slip off occasionally? Who noticed that they slip off quite easily, don't they? Mine slipped off a few times. But who thought the world looked like a different place yeah. when you had your goodness goggles on? Absolutely. I just had to do that just for Adam Grant. Okay. Now, now is the theme for, for Mission Sunday and uh, for this next season, season of missions. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. The last part of the verse says this, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You know, there is never a bad day. There is never a bad season to be focused on missions. I think about this and I think, well, it could be argued that multiplied millions in the Western world, uh, as the Bible would describe, in the valley of decision when it comes to the gospel. And we see nations really throwing off uh, sometimes Christian heritage, rejecting the gospel, poor decisions being made sometimes, you know, right from the governmental level right through to the social level. I'm reminded of the fact that there are even more multiplied millions of people who aren't in the valley of decision simply because they have never been presented with an alternative. There is no choice unless the gospel has been preached. And that is what missions is all about making sure that the name of Jesus is proclaimed, the goodness of God, the love of God through the cross of Jesus Christ is proclaimed to every tribe and nation and tongue upon the planet. So I want to talk to us today in, in, in the same theme of our year of being wholehearted, about being wholehearted about missions. You know, the fact is we are always on mission, I would hope. As, as Christians, and I, I do think that, that largely we are a church of people who understand mission, that you, you don't, when you meet Jesus, He doesn't touch your life and forgive your sin and set your feet on a rock just for you to warm a pew. Yeah. But that is just the beginning of an adventure that unfolds as we learn to be effective witnesses for Christ wherever we are. So we are on mission. 24-7, it would be a mistake to think that even missions, when we focus on world mission, that that is a, a special day thing. We just take a couple of days out a year to focus on this, but this is an everyday matter for the heart of God. When we talk about missions at New Hope, as opposed to just our general Christian mission to the world, we are talking about expressions of ministry outside of ourselves. And so what I want to do today is just begin by painting a bit of a picture. And I hope that this will be helpful, particular, particularly if you're newer in the church and maybe you've, you've, uh, you've become part of New Hope in the last year. I know that, you know, there'd be people sitting here today, this time last year, or you didn't know Jesus, but you do today and you're sitting here with us. And so I think it's important that, that we all get a grasp of maybe where we've come from and how we think about God's mission in the world and how we feel that God has called us to fulfil it. So uh, when I look at uh, locations, obviously mainly they are on foreign soil, but not all of that is. It, missions 
begins here in our own community, not just through the general witness of a great local church, but specific things that we do that we focus on to really get outside of ourselves, to get you know, out of the walls of the church and into schools, into the migrant community, into all kinds of areas of society where we might not normally go, but for us, we believe God is calling us to reach out to people, to people no matter what their circumstances or where they're at. I love the fact that God is bringing the whole planet to Australia. You actually don't have to go outside of Toowoomba now to be a cross-cultural missionary. And I think that's fantastic. And being able to have this facility and open it up to, you know, recently we had the the disability sector here and before that we had a a large section of uh, of people who've migrated, particularly to to this end of town. We We had, you know, lots of different cultures mixing out in our foyer and I thought it was absolutely brilliant. It starts locally and then it branches out nationally. And uh, we do that for, uh, uh, in a few ways. You would have seen the video footage of, of the Western trip. And Dennis and Rose are just back uh, from a trip. Remem- remember, we prayed for them while they were away because people are doing it tough. And it sounds like you guys got some great opportunities to minister to people uh, right out in the west of Charleville in our state. Uh, another thing that is probably, uh, it's a little bit of a pet project of mine, but it's still us a way of expressing ourselves as a local church and that is uh, every week, most weeks of the year, uh, I run literally a discipleship group online for senior pastors who want to implement simple discipleship strategies into their churches and, uh, and at the moment that stretches from Cooktown in the north to Bendigo in the south of pastors that Skype in every week and we meet in my office on a computer screen and we share our journaling and we pray for one another and we we celebrate the wins and we console the losses or whatever it is. Um, But that is an effective way of expressing who we are to others and people are happily receiving from the table that God has created through ministry in this place. Uh, as well as that, I, 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 I don't do it as often now, but uh, occasionally I travel around the nation and visit churches and actually do that leadership, development and training on site, spend a weekend with a pastor and his team. And, uh, and for me, that is all about expanding what God has put on this house. Yeah. Yeah. Then it moves to internationally and things start to get really exciting and ramping up. All the different nations that we're involved in. The Philippines, we've been involved in the Philippines now since about 1998. And uh, and that is exciting. Uh, What has happened, uh, you know, when we first started partnering, partnering with Edgar and Edna, they were a very successful apostolic missionary couple. They'd planted about 60 churches and, um, and had started a school, and then we've gotten involved. There's now over 400 churches. They've got probably one of the premier schools in Cebu as far as ed- education goes, and, uh, and they are absolutely pumping. But what is most exciting for those guys is they have gone from being a, a, a local indigenous church planting movement that receives Western support to now a missions sending church. They've planted a church in Thailand and now with our partnership uh, they're going into Thailand doing pastors conferences on discipleship and leadership development and uh, just recently they've gone into Cambodia uh, in the same way and we've been able to underwrite that where their vision is bigger than their finances and sometimes we've got because we are a prosperous nation we've got the opportunity to step in and empower them, our missions partners that we've known for all these years, to do significant things in other nations. And that is really, really exciting. Um, uh, Taiwan, up in Taiwan. Uh, Obviously, that's um, our our kids, our son and daughter, are up there and uh, pastoring the church in Taipei. Uh, You know, a, a nation of 23 and a half million people uh, that's on a postage stamp, uh, basically, or it's, it's about the size of Tasmania. I'm not sure they're about the same size, aren't they, postage stamp in Tasmania? And, uh, and so they've got 23 million people. They had, uh, they had an outreach in a sister city or a neighbouring city. So they're in 
Taipei, which is 2.7 million people in the city, they travel an hour by train and they get to, to another town, um, Taoyuan, and it has 2 million people in it, just one hour away. And they did an outreach there last night, their first ever outreach service. They had 38 people. Uh, 28 people were people that already attended their church from that area and the team that went down from Taipei. So they had 28 of those. They had 10 first-time guests in church, people who'd been in church for the first time in their lives, and one of those made a decision for Jesus. And so they were just pioneering that to see what might happen. And, uh, and so we're looking at if they, can, if they feel they can sustain it, we're going to shift some of our support down into that area so that they can actually establish a second church in Taipei. And, uh, and that's, that's pretty exciting. Personally, that's, I'm very proud of them and I'm very excited for my kids. But uh, the fact is, even aside from that, as a missionary endeavour, it's very fruitful and they're doing a fantastic job. Uh, of course, uh, Greg mentioned being on a, uh, a missions trip just recently, and that was in the nation of Sri Lanka, which has just recently opened up to us and, uh, and is starting to uh, uh, become a great opportunity for us. And then Cambodia, which we've just dipped our toe in with our missions partners in the Philippines to see what might start happening there. And all of these areas, if you think about it, when I look at from local through to national, through to international missions, it's all meant to reflect the statement Jesus made in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 when he said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And we want our missions policy literally to reflect that statement by Jesus. I believe that God wants to, in a sense, it's like dropping a stone in a pond and affect us right where we're at and then the ripples of the effect of what Jesus does amongst us should literally ripple out across the earth and, uh, and affect others in, 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 in ever-increasing circles of influence and we are part of that. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? Um, our strategy, and again, I don't want to bore you with this, but I think we need to come up to speed with it. Then I'm just going to preach for a little bit. Is that okay? Um, our strategy, we, we really haven't varied our strategy very much uh, for some time because it's so effective. Number one is we want to be in partnership. We don't want to sponsor people particularly, not when it comes to local church activity. The fact is because we're wealthy by comparison as a nation, we have to be careful to afford falling into the trap of like long-term sponsorship where mission work becomes dependent on us. And that is often the case. And it's not healthy for the long-term viability of any uh, mission work um, in, in another nation. Our mandate is to help partners become self-sustaining. So we've already, always had a history of helping people get up and running and then moving the resources on. And I guess that came from one of our previous senior pastors, Pastor Rod Plummer, himself a missionary, who mentored me. And he really opened my eyes to effective missions work and how it should work and how it shouldn't work. And I saw him so determined to keep move, moving resource on, even though that might seem a bit tough. But it's like, you know, at some point, you've got to stop spoon feeding the kids. Otherwise, they'll become dependent on you. That's only right. And funnily enough, Rod himself has become victim of that, of his own policy. As we've moved on from established works in Japan, where they're going, well, Rod's now planted uh, 17 churches. He's got 17 churches right across the earth, four in the Chinese-speaking world, most of them in uh, in Japan and then a few others and we have moved our support from Tokyo to Osaka and all over the place and eventually right out of Japan now and the only part of Lifehouse we're supporting is actually in Taipei. So we've always had this strategy of we need to move the resources around and try and always put it at the coalface as soon as a work becomes self-sustaining. 
Our past involvements, just so you know, thinking about them the other night, and this might not be exhaustive, but we've been involved in Indonesia in this way, planted or, or partnered to help plant over a thousand churches in villages in Indonesia, predominantly in villages. Uh, we've been involved in India, Thailand, Bangladesh, Japan, and Uganda. Um, And for the most part, we've just shifted resource as we see ministries are self-supporting. Then if I could just speak for a moment on focus, how we focus. We focus two things. We focus our finance because we can't take on, I, I learned a long time ago, there's a lot of genuine need out there. And if every person who's ever came up to me and said, I've got Aunt Mary, she's a missionary in this country, could we support her as a church? If I had said yes to that stuff, our vision would be so fractured and fragmented, we would not be doing anything with impact. So we've had to be pretty brutal on just, no, we're going to focus where we can, where we can put significant resources to see a breakthrough. And when that's broken through, When the time's right, we move on and we put our resources somewhere else. That's always been our financial strategy, to keep laser focus on things. And our tactics have been pretty similar. The second thing we focus, uh, it has always revolved around predominantly church planting and leadership development. The fastest way to disciple a community is through the local church par excellence. There is nothing that does it better. If you look at 2,000 years of church histories, great ministries rise up and they go. Great parachurch ministries that do things that the church in a season cannot do. But there's one thing in common. They come and then they go. There's only one thing that Jesus has built for 2,000 years that you can still see existing on the front lines. And that is the church of Jesus Christ. That's why we support local church planning and leadership development. It's the fastest way to reach a nation. We've always been involved with orphan children, from slums to ex-child soldiers, now with our focus on compassion. We've always done that simply because it needs to be done in Jesus' name. We've done specific humanitarian projects and select leadership projects. And really, this discipleship conference training that we keep talking about, keeping things simple, easy and fun, it has been one of the most significant things we've ever done with missions. So much more powerful than having an inspirational time, which is one of the things we used to do. Bring pastors together, have a great inspirational time, encourage them because they're, you know, often tired, weary. They lack the workers to help. And we'd go in sort of and try and put a shot in their arm and just encourage them. But discipleship has changed the game. Giving them very, very simple models that they can implement that actually produces the leaders they desperately need to reach out. And that has changed the game. It's just in demand. Wherever we go, people want this. And wherever we go, the report has been the same. The pastors are so encouraged. Even if there wasn't one inspirational message, they are so encouraged because they can see a simple way of mobilising their people to do what Jesus has told us all to do. Um, I want to read a letter that was given to me yesterday. This came from, uh, this is uh, Dr. Leslie Kegel, who is the president of the Church of the Four Square Gospel in Sri Lanka. Now, recently, we had an opportunity, because we are a generous missions-giving church, we had an opportunity where our our missions uh, partners in Sri Lanka um, were invited to do a conference. Peter was going to do this conference. They knew they were only going to get a certain core of their pastors because they just can't afford to travel and eat to be at a conference. And so Peter asked us whether we could inject something into it. And so this movement has nothing to do with us. They believe very similar to us. They're a Pentecostal church. And so we were able to give a few thousand dollars that empowered all of their pastors. So they had literally all their guys... Uh, or they had representatives from every region in Sri Lanka together for the first time ever, simply with a bit of uh, of our mission giving. 
This is to thank you and your church for your generous gift made toward our pastor's conference. We were so very blessed and edified by the teachings and practical advice on discipleship and church planting given to us by pastors Peter and Robin Patterson. Our pastors from, over tw- from all 25 districts of Sri Lanka were at the conference and they were tremendously impacted by what they received. Please thank your church for their generosity. As the Foursquare Church in Sri Lanka has been blessed by New Hope Church, we wish to bless you in return with every blessing from the Lord. Thanking you, Dr. Leslie Kegel. And that is just one little thing that we're able to do when we work with partners and we're generous towards God's mission. That just came up. That was organised in literally a couple of weeks. It was just like, well, we've got an opportunity. Would you be interested in supporting this? Well, what would our support do? Well, your support would pay for transport and feed pastors so they could attend this conference, guys who could never, ever even think about getting to it. What an amazing thing to be able to do. And and that empowers a whole movement. And so I want to encourage us, church. And and as I conclude this section, and I'm just going to preach for a little bit as I finish, but why? The question's got to come up, why? Why? Why should we do missions, let alone do it in a wholehearted way? And, and, and this, even asking the question, I, I needed to ask myself this question. It, it came about a funny way, but I just assumed everyone would get this. And then recently, I was speaking to someone who I have to say was actually on the, the way out of our church, leaving our church. And so I'm not mentioning names or anything, but this person literally said, I don't see why we should be giving money away. There's plenty of needs here. We need to look after people here and, uh, and they should look after themselves. Now, I had no words when someone said that to me. I had no words. I had a lot of thoughts though. The first thought was, come here so that I can grab you by the ears and slap you into the middle of next week. That was my first thought, but after I became a Christian again, it just took a few minutes. I settled down, I became a Christian again. I thought, actually, you've done me a favour. Because it's too easy for me to just assume that people understand the value of this. That it's just like, well, that's what Christians do, don't we? I think we assume so much, but I, I think we really need to know how close this is to the heart of God. It's, missions is countercultural, without a doubt. There's a whole mentality running through Australian society, and I think not just Australian society, but many affluent nations, that we're full. Close the borders, etc. Now, I'm all for tight border security when it comes to potential threat, but we also need to have compassion. I think we need to be reminded that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I don't care how long you've lived in this nation, you're just a steward. It actually doesn't belong to us. We're stewarding. Some nations steward that poorly, some nations steward that well. I suggest we should be people determined to steward that well. We've got to understand that whole, well, well, why should we help them when we've got needs here? That mentality isn't driven by the Spirit of Christ, but a spirit of fear and lack. I'm comfortable. I don't want anyone changing that. There's not enough to go around. And I look at that and I think that is the same mentality that during the sinking of the Titanic drove those already safe to row their half-empty boats away from the hundreds crying out and drowning in the icy water. And it should, that mentality should have nothing to do with the church of Jesus Christ. John chapter 4, verse 34, 35, in the Message Bible, Jesus said, The food that keeps me going is that I do the will of the one who sent me finishing the work that he started. As you look around right now, wouldn't you say that in about four months, it will be time to harvest? Well, I'm telling you to open your eyes and take a good look at what's right in front of you. These Samaritan fields are ripe. It's harvest time. There's a few things in this verse. I love it. John chapter four. 
The first thing Jesus says is that doing God's will feeds you. And Jesus, of course, was on missions there. He was in Samaria. They were the illegitimate sort of half cousins of the Jews, despised by the Jews. And so Jesus is literally on a little local missions trip and telling them, this is what we should be focused on. Doing God's will feeds you. And I look around at the body of Christ sometimes and I've got to be careful I don't become disparaging. But I do, I, I, I listen to podcasts. I listen to some of the podcasts by the, the best preachers building the biggest churches in the world. And they are inspiring. They are incredible. I look at what's available. I walk through a Christian bookshop or I, I look on Kindle at Christian books. I, I look at so much that's out there for Christians to consume. And it worries me how much of it is just about us. Now, I'm not saying I hear every guy's every sermon, but I've listened to some of these guys for months and haven't heard one appeal to operate outside the four walls of their own church. And I think we've got to be careful, like, that we don't adopt the mentality of, I must feed myself, I must feed myself. Jesus said to do his will. Hey, would you rather feed yourself? That, this is when Christians get the mentality, oh, I need deeper teaching. Oh, crap. Sorry, I've just got to say it. Call it for what it is. I haven't met a Christian who wanted deeper teaching that was doing the basics yet. I haven't met one. Fruitless Christians tend to mysticism. They go looking under rocks for devils or whatever. And we should have no time for it. Jesus said, doing the will of God feeds me. Man, would you rather feed yourself? Or would you rather God feed you? Man, you want God to feed you? Invest yourself where God wants to work. He'll make sure he pours oil on you when you're doing his will. You won't have to look for some fresh touch somewhere, man. You go looking for fresh touch, you'll get touched all right. And you deserve it. But if you focus in on what Jesus is focused in on, you focus in on the heart of God for the nations, for the people, of the earth for those who've never heard. Man, God will feed you. Second thing I see in this verse is they were just failing to see heaven's agenda. The true harvest. As I said earlier, it's, it's always the right time to do missions, but, but sometimes you seem to enter an especially favourable season. I, I really believe that this is where we're at right now. Um, recently, talking to Peter when he got back from Sri Lanka and he's gone again, I think. Or are they here? Today? No, they're gone again. Um, Peter, we are so blessed, by the way, to have Peter and Robin Patterson retire down this end of the country. He's a legend in the ACC movement uh, for many, many years in missions and with training leaders. And so uh, uh, it is great to have them on board. And Peter was talking to me and I knew, like, missionaries are really good at fishing for resources. Hey, he's not here so I can talk about him. Um, they're really good. And he's like, uh, you know, it was great. Sri Lanka was great and all the rest. And I've got a really good door opening up in Bangladesh. And straight away I was a bit like, I don't want to know about it. I know where this is headed. And, but then I, it twigged in my memory. I remembered that we were involved in Bangladesh. I wasn't here but the previous pastor, he was involved in Bangladesh. And as a matter of fact, the leader that he connected with, we're talking over 20 years ago, the leader he connected with for some crazy reason, I can't, I can't give his name here because that could be potentially bad if, if this will go on the internet. But, um, but this leader had profoundly influenced Pastor Rod in the way that he did small group discipleship, really invested in the DNA of this church 20 years ago, this Bangladeshi leader. And at the time, he was a very small leader in a small group doing some innovative things. Rod visited him and I just, I remember his name. I've always remembered his name and it's not, you know, it's not a Western name, but it's just stuck with me. Anyway, I said to Peter, against my better judgment, I said, What's the leader's name that you're working with? He's like, he's right really high up in his movement now, got a lot of influence. And Peter said the guy's name. 
And I said, that was the guy that we were connected to 20 years ago, the same guy. So next time you're in town, I think we need to have a coffee. Maybe God is doing something. Now doors are opening. Now is the time. There is never a bad time to do missions. But some seasons seem to be even more favourable and even more fruitful. And I I think that we have been in a season like that for some time. That is the season that we're in. Are you excited by that, church? And so uh, I guess I just want to finish us with a few, uh, finish up with a few questions. Before I do, I love this quote. I love this quote. It's by a guy called Dick Hillis, missionary to Asia. And he says, every heart with Christ, a missionary. Is Jesus in your heart today? If you know Jesus, then you've got the answer for the world. And every heart without Christ, a mission field. Don't you love that? Every heart with Christ, a missionary. Every heart without Christ, a mission field. And so the question becomes, and I I want to encourage you today, let's settle it in our hearts that this is heaven's agenda to touch the nations. And the question it begs for each of us is, how will I be involved? If you aren't already, and many, many people in this place are already involved. But again, if you're newer on the journey, or maybe you've been on the journey for a while, In this season, how will I be involved in praying, in giving, in going? I really want to encourage you to take that booklet, the little booklet Dean showed us, get a hold of one of them and keep it somewhere where you can, you actually leap through it more than once and pray for our partners. Really pray and believe God because great things are happening. And we want to believe with them for that to continue. How can you be involved? Well, as a church, New Hope's been positioned for many years to contribute strategically and significantly to world mission. If you consider New Hope your spiritual home, then I'm asking you today to consider being part of what we do through world mission. And I, I want to pray for us today if we'd all be happy to stand. And, uh, and I know today's been a bit different. I didn't do much preaching. I did a lot of talking. But I just felt like we need to come on the journey together. I don't want to leave anyone behind. I think occasionally we need to have a day out where we just talk about where we're headed, what God's doing. Are you cool with that? Is, is everyone cool with that? And, uh, and I, I pray also that, you know, God's Word has brought conviction to your heart, not in a sense of now I feel guilty, but in a sense of, you know what, I really can see what God wants me to see and I'm determined to step forward in that. So I want to pray for us all as we stand in God's presence today. Father, I pray my simple prayer for us is that you would move our hearts with what moves yours. Jesus, you could look up at a great group in a a city full of people that were, were, were different, a different culture, different view on life, even looked down upon. Jesus, you looked at them and just saw a ripe harvest field. And I, I believe you still see that, whether you're you're looking into the vast mission fields of, of Southeast Asia or Africa, Europe the Americas, wherever it is, the Pacific Islands. Lord, you you lift your eyes. You can still see people that need hope and, and need to experience your goodness and love. And I pray that you'd help us to see that too. That the the biases, that the the uh the fears, the self preservation that our culture tries to foist upon us would fall off us and we would truly be citizens of heaven who see beyond national boundaries see beyond continental boundaries and we see people the way that you see them 
in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, you know, in this place today, as I've spoken about this, it, this need to reach out to people is the heart of God. And you might be here today. And maybe church is not your normal thing. Maybe Christianity, following God is foreign to you. But you found yourself here somehow today with friends or family or however you got here. And, and I want to encourage you, friend, this, this is God's heart towards you. He's motivating and compelling people who have discovered His love to reach out to everyone who has maybe yet to discover His love. And, and for the next few moments, I want to give people in this place who may not be on that journey the opportunity to respond to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, God's Son, came, born of a woman, and then laid down His life, lived a perfect life, none of us could, as the Son of God, and laid down His life to pay a debt that none of us could hope to pay. At some point, we all get trapped in our own decision-making, in our own pasts, in things that we're less than proud of. But Jesus came to give us a brand new start, to bring hope where hope has gone. And if you're here today, and, uh, and as I've talked about Jesus, there's something in your heart. It's just like, man, I, I wish I could know God. I wish I could know His love. A friend, He does love you. He is reaching out to you. Even now, even through my simple words. God is reaching out to you because He loves you. He has a plan for your life. And there's something we do in every service at New Hope. Every week we give people the opportunity to pray a prayer. We all pray it together. I'll put it up on the screen, get people to put it on the screen if they would right now. It's a very simple prayer. It's a prayer of commitment and dedication. And, uh, and if you have never made the conscious decision to put your life in the hands of Jesus Christ, then I want to give you that opportunity today. While every head's bowed and every eye's closed, please, if you're in this place and you just know you need Jesus, would you just raise your hand right where you are? I'll acknowledge it. You can put it down again. But I really want to give people the opportunity. I want to know who I'm praying with today. So in this place, if you know you need Jesus, then I want to encourage you. You can respond to Him right now begins in the heart and I encourage you to take that step of faith and simply raise your hand awesome I see your hand that's wonderful you can put it down again now that's wonderful down here in front of me on my left others in this place I'll only let this sit here for a moment just a few moments just to give people the opportunity to make what can be the most life changing decision you could ever make I'm going to look across this auditorium one more time friend if that's you this is your moment. This is an opportunity for you to reach out and experience the love of God. Wonderful. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, we're going to pray this prayer together. And if you responded, whether I saw your hand, even if I didn't see your hand, if you responded, then I, I encourage you, make this prayer your own as we pray it together. Dear Jesus, I believe in you. Thank you for forgiving me. Come into my heart and I'll follow you. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Why don't we give it up for people who just made that decision this morning? And we want to encourage you on your journey. Uh, my wife is going to just let you know how, you, how we can help you uh, empower that journey. Uh, and for the rest of us, let's, let's be in prayer. Let's be considering how maybe, if you've never been on a mission trip, maybe how you could go. It will change your life to see how other people live and how desperately our world needs Jesus. And so uh, let's pray, let's give, let's go in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thanks, Pastor. Awesome. Can we thank Chris as he goes?